All right, so on question two of homework one star, um, you're given actually a very sparing amount of information about a matrix, a square matrix P, so it's square because it's n by n, right? Um, and it satisfies just a bare set of two conditions. It's a symmetric matrix, so it's equal to its own transpose, and it's also an idempotent matrix, which means it's equal to its own square. Right? So these are the only two things that we know about the matrix P. And the claim is, and this is a claim that you're meant to justify, is that these two pieces of information are sufficient to prove that P is a projection matrix in a certain way. And so I think maybe, Brian, this goes to the question that you're asking about the, the setup, is that one of the ways that we know to identify a projection matrix is using the projection matrix formula. So maybe this is a, a fair way to set it up. So if P is equal to A times the inverse of A transpose A times A transpose, then P is a projection matrix. So in other words, being able to write P in, being able to write P in this form is a sufficient condition to make P a projection matrix. In particular, it's a projection matrix onto the column space of A, right? That's where A came from as we wrote down in the columns of A a basis for the subspace onto which we were projecting, onto call of A. But I guess uh, where the confusion comes in here is that we don't, in this problem, need to know what A is in order to justify that P is a projection matrix, because the other, I suppose, going back to the definition of what projection is in the first place, projection of, uh, of B onto a subspace S uh, was one of the ways to define projection of B onto S um, is that it's supposed to be a point PB which has the property that this angle right here, is indeed a right angle. In particular, the, the error vector, the vector that joins B to this supposed projection, that this vector is orthogonal to S. It's orthogonal to that subspace. Um, and so this is a definition that doesn't rely upon us being able to produce the matrix P in a particular format, A times the inverse of A transpose, A times A transpose, um, but just relies upon the geometry of the situation. And so this is the, the sort of notion of projection that is workable in this problem. Because we don't, uh, up front, know a matrix A uh, that builds for us this matrix P. All we know about P are these two algebraic properties. And we're supposed to then deduce from that that P satisfies this second notion of what it means to be a projection. So your, your, your mandate is just to verify the question mark over here, right? Is just to demonstrate that this angle is indeed a 90 degree angle. Right? That we have orthogonality between the error vector that goes from B to PB and any other vector which lies inside of this subspace. So the way I've kind of set that up is connected PB to some other place on this, uh, on this space, which because this space is the column space of P, column space, if you'll remember, consists of everything which can be written as P times something. It's a set of all P times uh, V for all vectors V. In this case, those Vs would be an Rn because P is an n by n matrix. Um, so everything in this subspace has the form P times something, which is why I've labeled this second thing as PA. Right. And so if we can show that for arbitrary vectors A, that the vector joining PA to PB, that would be this vector right here, and the vector which joins B to PB, that's this vector here, going all the way up to B. If we can show that those two form a right angle, 
then we verified this notion of projection. So all we need to do is show that these are orthogonal to one another. Um, to verify that two vectors are orthogonal, we need to take the dot product and see that the dot product is zero, right? So that makes this from a geometric question into an algebraic question. Right. If we can show that these two vectors have a dot product of zero, so I'm going to call this vector here v and the other vector down here w. If we can show that their dot product is zero, then we have proven the claim. We just need to show that v dot w is equal to zero. But the trick about, the trick about that is we need to turn this statement about a dot product into a statement that we can verify using the properties of P. And so we need to also think about how did we reconceptualize the dot product in the first half of the semester. Rather than seeing this as a dot product, what was our way of, of thinking about what a dot product looked like in linear algebra? Yeah, how did we rewrite the dot product? Yeah, we rewrote it. In order to bring matrix multiplication to the table, we just reconceptualized the dot product as a matrix product of the transpose of a vector with another vector. Right? When, if v and w are thought of as columns, then their dot product is nothing more than the transpose of v, which turns v into a row, multiplied by w as a column. And the result of that matrix product is the dot product of that row with that column, which is v dot w. Um, and so this now is what we need to verify, that v transpose w is equal to 0. But we need to connect both v and w back to the context that's provided for us in the problem. We need to rewrite what is v in terms of the matrix P and the vectors a and b, and likewise with w. Um, so what is v in relation to the vectors a and b and the matrix P? How can I write a vector which goes from b to pb or vice versa? This is where the hint comes in. Easy minus B? Yeah, that's one way of doing it. And the other way would just be the opposite, and it shouldn't matter which one we do. V is nothing more than the, the difference of those two vectors, P, B minus B. What about W? P, B minus P, A. And so now that is what we need to verify where a and b are just some vectors in Rn. But p, on the other hand, is something that we have some properties to tell us about. We know, for example, that when you go through the process of expanding out this left-hand side, if you end up with a p transpose, you can replace it with a p, because p is symmetric. If you end up with a p squared somewhere, you can replace that also with a p, because p is idempotent. So the two properties that we know that characterize p for us their function in this proof is going to be to help us to simplify this left-hand side and demonstrate that it must be equal to 0. So that is as much as I want to say about this, because the rest of the shape of that is, is just an algebraic massage, if nothing else. <laughs>